Well, that's terrific. Thanks. You must all be looking forward to an exciting evening, as I am, because you um, became quite very quickly. I'm Graham Samuel. I'm chairman of the Business Advisory Board in the Monash Business School, uh, and want to welcome you to the second of our leadership panels. I'm going to push that over the edge before long. Um, but the second of our leadership panels, these are um, an unusual way of doing things. We bring a panel together of eminent persons in a variety of areas that relate to the subject matter of that we're going to talk about, and as you will soon discover, we're going to have a quite interesting discussion involving um, those that are on the panel. I'm going to provoke, and I mean provoke, um, with some interesting questions to start off, uh, and then we're hoping that the panel will actually gather its own pace and start uh, talking or debating with each other, and then in particular, and I want to emphasise this, we want you, um, the participants, to join in the discussion, the conversation. The way to do that is just to wave your hand uh, and um, we'll uh, then take it from there because there'll be a roving mic that will come around to see you. So before I start, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting? I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. You will see that there is um, a camera at the back there. It is actually filming and live streaming um, what is uh, happening this evening. And um, unless anyone really objects, and they should stand up and say so now, you should accept that the fact that you're here this evening means that you, everyone that sort of is around you, plus everyone that will be watching on live stream will know that you're here. And whatever you say will go out uh, on the live stream as well. So um, if anyone objects to that, please say that now and jump up and go outside and have a drink. But otherwise, um, you're part of the proceedings. That's good. Um, now, our panellists. Uh, look, we've got a fascinating group here this evening. I'm going to start, um, uh, I'll start up that end. We've got Lucas Grunewald. He told me that I couldn't say it and that the way I did pronounce it would be the best way that he'd ever heard it anyway. Correct. So, um, <laughs> Lucas is the Uber State Manager for Victoria and Tasmania. I don't have to say anything more when I mention the word Uber, and Uber is no longer a noun, it is now a verb. Yeah. We hear of things being Ubered and Uberized, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and um, we're going to have some bit of fun there. Keeping in mind, by the way, that until July last year, I was chair of the Taxi Services Commission of Victoria. <laughs> All right? So that'll be interesting. Um, now, moving along, um, next we've got Rebecca Horn. Uh, Rebecca Horn is the Chief Digital Information Officer at the National Rugby League. And I was on the commission there until March this year. And she's had 20 years' experience in digital telecommunications, mobile and media companies. And I think we have some quite interesting discussion with Rebecca about the future of sport and television um, and the, uh, the like. Um, we've got Hugh Williams. He's had a career in three parts as an entrepreneur, professor and technical executive and he's currently um, a vice president of engineering at Google and um, Google has also become a verb now in terms of Googleizing the world and the like and we'll be talking a bit about that as we, um, we get going. Um, uh, so we've got that Kate Morris, founder and CEO of Adore Beauty. Um, uh, Australia's first online beauty store. She launched the business from her garage in 19... I shouldn't say this because it'll actually age you. Okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. In 1999 at the age of 21 while still an undergraduate student. And uh, we had a bit of a chat about online and online marketing uh, and the like. And the David Schaefer, I've known David since he was knee-high to a grasshopper, uh, but he's now the executive um, director of Kogan. Uh, Kogan started off as um, a little operation that was there to challenge the major retailers, uh, and a challenge it has been, and has been very interesting, particularly with the recent purchase by Kogan of the trading name of Dick Smith and what that's done, and we're going to find some interesting things that will come out of uh, all that. So, let me sit down, and uh, Dave and I are going to share this, uh, and I do urge you, and for those that I can't see, please um, either yell out or whatever if, if I don't catch your eye. Um, I'll move that out of the road so that we can... OK, so where are we going to start? Well, Lucas, given my history, why don't we start with you and Uber? Sounds good. Right, so <laughs> Uber came to Australia in 2012, and it had some brushes with various regulators and the like um, throughout the world um, before then, but it came in 2012 uh, to Victoria, and essentially you said to the Chair of the Taxi Services Commission, uh, and to the Victorian government, get nicked. Um, essentially, you said, you don't like the laws, you're not going to obey them, and you're just going to go and do it your way. And now look at where you are now, where the laws, if we live long enough, will be changed in Victoria to actually legalise Uber. Um, did you do it the right way? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, thankfully, I wasn't around in 2012, so I can't take direct uh, for, for, for sort of that. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think you kind of answered half of it in, in the second part of the question, and that is uh, we're two weeks away from the ride-sharing bill being presented back to the lower house in Victoria, um, at which point we will, uh, ride-sharing will be formally regulated, which is a great outcome for customers. Um, but I, I think at the core of that, and, and the reason we've seen the success that we have, is because it was, there was a gap in the market. And... Um, and I, I don't think it's just about taxi. I think it's about the, chain, the, the changing um, shift in views of car ownership and the like that we have here. Um, and, and so as people see, as people are less, like, less and less likely to own a car and more and more likely to view transport as a service, which means it means Uber, it means taxi, it means public transport, it means walking. Um, we've seen, obviously, our serv- the demand for our services increase um, substantially to the point that we now have a million um, riders here in Victoria so quite a significant proportion of the population, um, and 22,000 driver partners who use Uber to, to earn an income. And so I think just ha- having the customer backing behind us um, has enabled a lot of the change that we've seen through the reforms as well. And by the way, I'll say on the record that I absolutely agree with the process you took, although I tried to do otherwise, um, because of the laws, and I said this public were arcane, uh, and frankly they need to be knocked over. And the only way they're going to be knocked over, I thought, was to empower consumers, and I'm going to use that expression because as we go around, the empowerment of consumers and the uh, priority to be given to consumers rather than to business as to how their business is conducted, you will find is going to be a very common theme. And I thought what Uber did was it said, we're going to empower consumers, it's con- and it's consumers that actually that have forced the government to um, bring about change. A very quick question. Um, following the, uh, the, the hiccup, the problem with... Uh, the trains last week, Um, the Minister for Transport, Jacinta Allen, came out and said, I'm going to regulate surge pricing. How did you react? Sorry, you caught me, caught me, Mabir. Look, I I think there's there's an opportunity for us to educate um, the public, including, obviously, including um, the the government, um, around how dynamic pricing works. And so I'm sure many of us were affected by the train outage um, two Thursdays ago. Um, The the way that dynamic pricing essentially works is um, it's about incentivising drivers to come onto the platform. And so um, drivers are are just like you and me. I I normally at this stage would put your hand up if you're a driver because I guarantee there's probably one of of you or us in the room. Um, But these are are people like you and I and they need, at times they need an incentive to get out on the road um, because ultimately they're trading off time spent with their friends and family to come and give someone a lift. And so in a world where pricing is static, um, we're, we're less able to respond from a, from, uh, to, to, sp- to, pi- um, to spikes in demand. And what we saw from the train crisis, um, or train outage rather, two Thursdays ago, was a huge spike in demand. And when that spike occurred, naturally the, the prices did increase for a period of time while, while supply and demand stabilised. Um, what that enabled was thousands more Victorians having a choice to be able to get home. Um, and that's a choice without that pricing algorithm in place. Um, it's, it's opening up the app and saying no cars available instead of opening up the app and seeing a higher price. And so really it's about choice for customers um, and enabling, coming back to the, the theme of enabling customers to make a decision. So does Uber pass all the surge on to the drivers? Yeah, so, so Uber takes a, a service fee and that's, that's, a, that's a percentage. And so the, the drivers, we don't, we, don't, we don't take the cream or anything like that. They're earning the, the, their standard generally 80% of the fare, including that, that sure. economic pricing. So Uber makes more money too, but... Yeah, but at the end of the day, I'd like to say that it's you know, one hour of one hour of slightly higher prices really doesn't impact our, our bottom line, um, particularly for all the stress that it puts us through in the public's eye. And and Kate, if you were running short on a product that was in excessive demand by your buyers, would you lift your price or would you leave it the same? No, we leave it the same. But look, we we have a very sorry. Hold on. Yes. Um, look, we. We have kind of a different approach to things, and I guess um, everybody, you know, every company, particularly if you want to be a disruptive company, makes a choice sometimes about does the end justify the means, and the way that we roll at Adore Beauty is that no, it doesn't, and you do the right thing, and you do the right thing no matter what, Um, and I guess that's why Adore Beauty is a $50 million company, and maybe Uber's a however many billion dollar company, and maybe that's how it is, but I'm okay with it. I think I think the, the the distinction as well, Kate. I think is you control your product, right? So you can order, you can forecast that there's a, a spike in. Um, I'm trying to think of what hair products I use. Uh, American Crew, pomegranate, or whatever it is called. Yeah. Um, and so you can accordingly like order in that. So we don't. Our drivers are independent contractors. Um, we can't. 
kind of like pre, pre-order them or pre-put them onto the road. And so we need pricing to be, to be there, to be dynamic, to enable that balance of supply and demand. And I guess if government were to ask me, which they won't, um, I'd be saying just be careful how much more you want to distort a market that's been distorted for decade, decades and led to the problems we've got at the moment, including uh, yeah, the obligation to buy out taxi licences at very substantial sums. You know, distortions come back to bite you in the backside if you're not careful. Um, Kate, we, we, uh, I, I open up with you just um, to ask you a question, um, but um, you, you're, you've gone online... I remember a few years ago, Maya, before Richard Umbers, um, announced that it was going to go online yep. um, because it could see that this was a, an issue it had to be dealt with. And what it did was it said, we're going to sell the same product that we sell in our stores for the same price and um, you'll have delivery in three or four or five days or a week or whatever it might be, but you can buy it online. Do you think that was the way to go? Well, I think if they'd done that 17 years ago when they first had the opportunity to, then probably that would have been perfectly fine because it gives you a chance to evolve your value offering over the years. But to start doing it, you know, when everybody else had already moved on past that, I mean, I've been in e-commerce for 17 years and that was where it started was just purely, you know, having things on a website was a unique point of difference. But by the time I got to it, no, it wasn't, it wasn't enough to just sell things on the internet. Um, and we've certainly had to evolve our business model in that time. I mean, it's not enough to say that our point of difference is that we're online. You know, you can't, you can't just do that. Um, I mean, where, where we've sort of got to, you know, things, things have evolved as far as what I've seen in e-commerce. You know, at the start it was just, oh, we sell things online. Well, that's neat. I can shop on the internet. And then it got to, I can shop on the internet because it's cheaper. And then it got to, I can shop online because it's more convenient. And now where we're seeing <coughs> things are getting really fun, particularly for our business, is that customers are saying, hey, this is a way I can discover new things, things that I could never discover in a store and I can see somebody using a product on YouTube and then I can go and, you know, fulfil that straight away or, you know, I can make my entire purchasing decision from where to go online and, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the trouble with digital. I mean, it moves so fast that if you don't get on at the start, you don't get the chance to evolve with it. You're just catching up the whole time. Now, in terms of setting a pace, David, um, <laughs> Kogan set some pace in it some years ago when it started, um, not just selling the Kogan branded product, but selling other well-known brands, but at a fraction of what you'd be able to buy them in a retail store in Australia. How'd you do it? Thanks, Graham. And can I say that um, when you say that Kogan is a verb, I'll know that we've, <laughs> we've achieved our mission <laughs> when you Kogan something. Um, so, in 2011, we sort of looked at our business model and said to ourselves, are we really being honest with customers? Prior to that time, we called ourselves a manufacturer and designer of consumer electronics. You know, we had a few TVs and a few digital displays and a couple of Blu-ray players, but we had no R&D capacity and we had no manufacturing plans. So we were not designing anything, we weren't manufacturing anything, we were really a retailer. So we were a good retailer, we were cutting out lots of middlemen, we were achieving lots of efficiencies in, in, in the supply chain, but we were not a manufacturer and designer of consumer electronics first and foremost, we were a retailer. And when you're honest with yourself and you say, my core competitive advantage is in retail, not in manufacturing and designing, then it opens you up to retailing other things, not just, you know, the things that have your badge. So we thought, all right, let, let's say that we want to add on third-party brands. Where in the world can I find the lowest cost for this product? And what we saw was there was a massive disparity between the global price of mass, you know, mass consumer items like iPhones, Samsung phones, cameras, and the Australian price. And if you think about your own experience growing up, I remember the days when you'd go to Hong Kong or you'd go to the US and people wouldn't ask you, what did you see? They'd ask you, what did you buy? Because people were so used to being ripped off in Australia. <laughs> and uh, all, all it took was looking at the supply chain from a global perspective rather than a local perspective. So we were able to source Canon cameras, Nikon cameras, iPhones, Samsung phones internationally and significantly undercut the local stores. And um, we did it. And it, you know, it immediately became the biggest part of our business by revenue. 
So in 2011, you know, before 2011, in 2010, we were about an eight to $10 million revenue business. Now we're a $300 million revenue business. But in 2011, the third party brand part of our business immediately became the, the biggest turnover part and it brought huge, amount, huge amounts of traffic to our site, which then we could convert to buying higher margin private label products. So if I had to distill it to one thing, it would be being honest with you know, what you stand for as a business and what your core competitive advantage is, and then thinking about things from first principles. So not just how does Maya source, to your previous example, but what is the best way of sourcing this thing? If I was to start with a blank slate, how would you do this right? Is Amazon going to challenge you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, anyone who says no uh, is, has their head in the sand. A Amazon is clearly a Goliath and um, they are dominating US retail and lots of bricks and mortar retailers in the US are suffering. But um, if you look at how retail is sort of uh, migrating itself with the advent of the internet, what you've, what you've got in retail is basically the elimination or reduction of the importance of the retailer. So traditionally, a, a brand would go to a retailer and say, I need you to get my product all around the country and you needed a, a footprint of bricks, of bricks and mortar stores to go and put that product in front of people around the country. With the advent of the internet, a brand can have a direct online website and then a couple of key stores in city centres and they can have a direct retail capability. And with the advent of Amazon, it's even easier for brands to do that because Amazon can handle the fulfilment. So for us, you know, looking at what Amazon does as a business, it is a significant threat in third-party brand products, but we control... 50% of our GP, so not our sales, but our, our actual gross profit, is from private label product where we control the entire supply chain. We control that product. We've purchased it at the globally competitive price in China. Our private label product is cheaper on Kogan than you can buy any private label product on Amazon in the US. So if you control your supply chain, then you can protect yourself from the Amazon threat. And we will be listing our private label product on Amazon. That's interesting. So you'll, you'll take your Kogan product and have it for sale on Amazon. They'll take their cut. But, but, and why would you do that? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't that cannibalise the Kogan business itself? That's the Kogan operation. So uh, I'm a firm believer that sometimes in business, if you're going to be cannibalised, it's better to cannibalise yourself than have someone else cannibalise you. <laughs> I think it was Steve Jobs who said, you know, when he introduced the iPhone, he was asked, is this going to cannibalise iPod sales? And he's like, yeah, it's going to cannibalise iPod sales, but it's better that I cannibalise myself than have someone else cannibalise me. So uh, I think it is, it, it's a fait accompli that Amazon is going to dominate a significant portion of online retail. They will have prime membership, which people have a significant incentive to buy through Amazon first and foremost, to start their online shopping experience through Amazon. So given that a significant portion of people are going to be doing that anyway, to say, oh, I'm gonna pretend that I've, you know, uh, that I'm, I'm immune to that and that 50% of, let's say, you know, more than 50% of product searches on the internet in the US are on Amazon. There are more than double the product searches on the internet on Amazon in the US than on Google. So to ignore those statistics and say, oh, I'm going to pretend like I'm immune, it, it's a recipe for disaster in my view. So we would rather list on Amazon, be part of the journey, let the rising tide of the growth in online retail generally lift our boat and then um, compete on the basis of our supply chain and private label product. Um, Hugh, just recently the Productivity Commission produced a report about who owns your data um, and it said the consumer owns it. Uh, and it said that the consumer would have a right to be able to take that data and to transfer it to competitors and the like. And that I'm, I'm, 
I'm verbaling a bit, but that's that's essentially, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure that that's something that is necessarily embraced by government, but it certainly raises some really interesting issues because every day I would venture to suggest everyone in this room uses Google at least once, if not many, many times. Anyone want to dispute that? I did not have a day where I didn't. I, which, <laughs> Christmas Day or New Year's Day? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, with one exception, everyone else in the room has said, yeah, they admit that they use Google once a, a, a day. And, and you know, it's the first place you go if you just want to get, get a result of something. Um, and, and that is extremely facilitative, but some would say with the data that's being collected by Google that it is potentially very invasive. What would you say? Thanks, Graham. Um, so first thing I should say is I'll be an ex-Google employee on Friday, so, um, so uh, um, you know, move back to Australia, time to do, time to do something else. But um, I, I think it's a great question. I mean, I think, I think the way I'd, I'd come at it is the same way that Lucas came at the, the Uber question, really. I mean, I think you have to ask, well, what, what, do, what do consumers want? What do end users want in their products? And, you know, and how do you provide that service? And I think, you know, Google... Uh, has a long history, and I also worked at eBay and Microsoft. They all have long histories of doing what the consumer wants, what the user wants, and providing the service that they want. And so I think, you know, Google takes that responsibility very seriously of being custodians of data and using that data to improve the service. And I'm, I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense to introduce a regulatory framework that hampers companies from, you know, innovating on behalf of the users and delivering um, and delivering services to those users. I also wonder about how you do that in practice. You know, so, so I think it's it, you know it's 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 in, I think it's 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 interesting that Australia is having this conversation and, and important that that conversation is had. Um, you know, I've spent the last 12, 13 years in the US, so I don't I don't have all the context that that perhaps you know people in this room have. I think it's it's interesting that conversation is going on, but what are you actually going to do in practice with that conversation? I mean, this is a uh, you know these are companies that, that exist worldwide with data centres everywhere that are custodians of everybody's data and I, I don't know that borders matter so much um, and I think if you apply restrictions to these companies that affect what they do in Australia, well you're going to hamper the experience within Australia and you're going to find that people VPN into some site somewhere else to do the thing that they wanted to do. So, so I think it's, it's a little protectionist it's a little old school, it's a little like the taxi story. Um, I think we need to move beyond that and just make sure that you know companies use data in the right way to provide the services to their customers and protect that data and look after that data on behalf of the customers and uh, and, and continue to do the right thing. I'm not sure we should sort of wind the clock back. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does and store that up, everyone, because I'm going to put a question to you in a few moments about slowing it down and dealing with the implications of what we're dealing with. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Before we do that, um, Rebecca, uh, you and I had a lot to do with each other back when I was with the NRL and we went through an extraordinary um, event towards the end of last year when we sold the television rights for NRL for a record sum. Um, that uh, was a follow-on from the AFL having done the same thing. Um, but what was more interesting was that we dealt with um, a potential competition with free-to-air networks and no competition in subscription television uh, because there was only one buyer, Fox Sport. Um, and uh, that was always a problem and for me, you know, having no competition is not really enthusiastic uh, or something I'd like to embrace. Uh, but you always know when you've got a, one buyer that you're, you're almost at the mercy of the buyer. Um, and so one of the things we started to look at in the NRL was how do we deal with the issue of 2022-23 when the existing television rights deal <laughs> expires? And as we're reading every day now, free-to-air television networks are having a real question mark about how much they're paying for sports rights. Um, they used to be the halo. You know, you had to have them because if you didn't have them, then you couldn't cross-sell to other programs. But there's a real question mark as to how much is being paid. Seven network is feeling the pain of it. Nine network is feeling the pain. Ten network is feeling a bit more than the pain um, uh, in terms of um, uh, yeah, what is paying for some of those things. So... Free-to-air is looking potentially fragile. There's still one buyer for subscription television, or is there? Stan, Netflix, Fetch TV, Google TV, Amazon, um, Apple TV, Amazon, Amazon, NRL TV. 
You want to comment? Uh, I would be... Uh, I think that, you know, the sports industry broadly in this country has enjoyed um, large sums of funding from traditional media partnerships um, and, you know, often telcos. The challenge in Australia, I think, in terms of NRL TV is that you've got a population of 24 million people. Um, you know, you look at a, an organisation like Stan, for example, and, you know, it's it, it would be... Uh, not outrageous to say that it's probably unlikely that that business will be profitable um, ever, <coughs> given the rising cost of content, 10 bucks a month. Unlike Netflix, they can't amortise their cost over a gazillion territories um, and kind of, you know, do better content deals because they're buying globally. Uh, and so I think the world um, is a better place for sport in this country if you have a strong partner. Um, because you, you are limited in how many people you can draw into a service and get them to pay, number one. Uh, I think the promotional benefits uh, for a big platform that has you know, millions of people coming to it on a regular basis is a, is a really important thing for sport that you know, is, a, is a weekly occurrence, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, the, the, the strategic question we're trying to answer is, come 2022, uh, how do we best position ourselves as a sport to have good negotiating ability in a world that is so disrupted today? We don't even know what 2022 will look like. We know it will look very different. Um, there might be uh, a slowing of, of um, new entrants into the market, but certainly I think we're going to be globalised in terms of the Amazons and Twitter and, you know, we're already there, really. So the question for us becomes how do we create um, enough value such that whomever we're talking with in 2022 um, perceives us to be something that they're willing to pay large sums of money for. Um, and we've taken, we've taken the view that the best thing we can do is stop being a, a sort of outsourced third-party business model, which is what the NRL certainly was um, for a long time. You know, there's, there's sort of intermediaries at every point in the value chain taking a little piece of, um, of the revenue, be that ticketing, be that merchandise, be that membership, um, be that signage on the ground, be that, you know, um, merchandise, as I said. And so our view is what we have to do is get really close to our fans. And, and in doing these big deals, what we've done also is almost disintermediate ourselves from the fans. So from a, from a sort of fan's point of view, you could look at, for example, um, any of the coverage that you see in the media and think that that is sort of the, the place for that sport. And what we need to do is create a place and create a relationship with the fan, uh, customer, consumer, however you want to phrase it. We choose to call them fans. Um, and know them to a single identifier and be able to transact with them. Um, now, we've got about 7 million data records around the NRL that have either come in and bought a ticket or attended a game or done something with us. It's all over um, the place in terms of data capture. So we're putting it all into a data warehouse we're cleansing it um, and we will have a single customer view of those data records by probably April next year. Um, and I think that that's what drives value for us. In terms of who we talk to in, in 2022, um, you know, you've had Twitter go and buy sports rights in the US, you've had Amazon buy some. Uh, all of those platforms are trying to, again, just like we are, carve out space in the value chain that they don't necessarily own today. Um, and so what we have to do is, is kind of ensure that we've got our house in order, that we have the best possible um, strategic opportunity to, to keep our rights at a premium. Hasn't Stan and Netflix hit a sweet spot in the market by saying to particularly younger, younger generation, if you want to get movies and that's all you want, we'll sell it to you for $10 a month. Um, if you want to get all the other channels that Foxtel has got, well, to do that and get moves, you're going to cost $60, $70 a month. But if you want a special approach just to get movies, we'll sell it to you for $10 a month. And you get a vast array of movies or of TV shows, Game of Thrones and, and various things like that. Um, if you want to get sport like AFL or NRL or whatever, it's going to cost you $70, $80 a month at the moment to do it. 
isn't there scope for the AFL or the NRL in particular to be able to say, look, for the six months of the year or the nine months of the year that we are live on the ground, we can actually sell you a product, not for $80 a month, but for $20 a month? Uh, potentially. I mean, at some point, that may be an option. It's about, it's about the um, willingness to pay. And what you see, the challenge with, these, with, with subscription is that you, you sort of reference Stan or you reference Netflix. So let's take Netflix because it's a sort of arm's length um, organisation, as in it's not Australian. The reason that they are able to prevail is because they are able to have a low price point because they've got scale. The challenge in Australia is you've got to charge a reasonably chunky price point with a subset of 23, 24, 25 million people who are willing to subscribe. So if we say we think we've got, you know, 7 million people that are sort of interested in some shape or form in rugby league, you're then converting them to a, a, an amount per month. What we know from um, um, examples from Netflix is that what people do is they don't stay necessarily the whole month. So what happens if your team starts losing or, you know, this is, the, this is the challenge. People will move in and out because it's so on demand now that, for example, behaviour on, on Netflix and these big organisations come into any market and set the behaviour. People expect to be able to basically, you know, sign up, sign out. So they're signing up for, for House of Cards. They're, they're bunking out. They're coming back in a month later for Orange is New Black or whatever it is. So the, the challenge with that model is that you've got a low price point and you've got <coughs> ultimate flexibility on the part of the consumer. Um, and if it's a $2 billion organisation, it's a lot of people signing up and sticking at 20 bucks a month to get to the $2 billion. And so that's the, the very real kind of dynamic in the marketplace. Um, digital disruption, have a look. Can we, what does it say? Can we slow it down? Should we? Right. Um, this goes to a question that was asked at a session that Edward organised um, a little while ago with Richard Baldwin, I think, wasn't it? And Richard has written a book called The Great, Great Convergence. Convergence. Yeah. But the theme that he did at the discussion that we had uh, one evening um, uh, uh, with Monash and, and with Richard was this. He said, look, this is a major disruptive process that's occurring. You're putting taxi drivers out of jobs. You might say that they can go Uber if you like and become Uber drivers, right? But you're putting them out of jobs. Um, you're looking at disrupting what's happening in sport and sport broadcasting. Google's disrupting all over the place. I mean, um, you know, with the various interventions you've got. So is Amazon. Amazon is potentially going to put a challenge to you and to you, and more importantly to David Jones and to Meyer and to all those retail stores in the retail strips and in the CBD, etc. There's a major disruption occurring. And then we go to the disruption that uh, technology is, is causing, whether it's the manufacture of motor vehicles or it's um, other manufacturing processes or the like. Yeah, Donald Trump says the way I'll start manufacturing again is just put up some walls around America. He's probably forgotten that robots are probably going to do a lot of the work that were previously been done by human beings. So the question that Richard Baldwin... Now, the statement he made was highly disruptive could lead to a major social disruption, therefore what we should do is try and slow it down. Um, I was a bit cheeky in responding that if he could cram me King Canute, I'd have a bit of a look at it, but can you slow it down? How do you deal with the disruption that's occurring as a result of the digitisation, the technology that each of you are involved in? Kate. Oh, look, I don't, I don't know if you can slow it down. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's the industrial revolution, isn't it? Only it's just happening really, really fast, except, over, you know, not over 100 years. It's all just happening right now. Um, look, I, I do worry about that too. It's, it's, OK, well, all of these people that are not going to have jobs anymore, what are they going to do? And I feel like there's probably not enough thought really being put into it that everyone's just going oh yeah no disruption it creates more jobs or it'll all just kind of sort itself out and well what if it doesn't you know I think you're going to have a pretty big problem if you've got I mean as we saw with the whole idea of Trump getting in over in the US is that there's it's you know from all of these sort of disgruntled people whose lives have changed in a way that they're not happy with um, you know 
know, are we all going to be happy with that outcome, even if we do have Netflix? So I think, let, yeah. Let me I, ask the question, what are you going to do? I don't know what you do about it. And smarter people than me should think about this, but I, like, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you do. Um, I mean, does it does it have to be you know much more of an investment than the government's kind of half-assed innovation program that you know has done nothing? You know, does it need to be something that's a really considerable investment in how are we going to reskill the people whose jobs are going to be gone in the next ten years? Um, you know, there's. I mean, I would, I would assume there are, you know, there are other things to do and, and areas of growth and whole new industries sprouting up. What more can we do about that? I mean, as a university, you know, what can Monash do about that? Well, how is it changing the way that it teaches its students and, um, you know, to, to teach them agile thinking and how to be spotting the problems of tomorrow and solving them? I kind of feel like that's what we should be teaching people. Right, well now, so you're one disruptor that says, like, I don't know what to do, so let someone else sort it out. Um, I'm going to actually ask you uh, in a moment, so think about this as we get some, some answers from, from others, uh, and I'll be interested whether anyone's got a, a view, a proactive view about what you might do to deal with the disruption that you're causing. I think that uh, the premise of the question is that there's something that needs to be done about disruption, and... I really have a problem with the premise of the question because it's creating this idea that there is a problem that needs to be solved by government when I can't see any evidence that there is even a problem. Uh, if you look at what the internet has actually done, uh, it has democratised almost every industry from a previous situation where there were a handful of companies in most industries controlling it and it has democratised it by opening up a huge amount of people to participate in the economy that otherwise would have been participating in a lesser capacity. So you've got more people working thanks to Uber, you've got more people uh, employed and uh, launching their own shops thanks to Google bringing them traffic, um, you've got more participation in the economy by the average man than ever. So this idea that there is an actual problem because of disruption, as if disruption is a bad thing. Disruption is the consequence of someone identifying a win-win opportunity in the, in the economy and developing a solution that provides an advantage to the consumer. As we all heard, all of these businesses are consumer focused. They're solving a consumer problem. The consumer had a choice, thanks to the ACCC, that says you're allowed to choose this or choose this. So long as that there is no force compelling somebody to choose something as there was in the taxi industry, uh, and the consumer is choosing that willingly, there's no problem. Uh, the consumer has opted for something better because a company has offered something better. So the fact that there are consequences to that in the broader economy and that the taxi industry is being destroyed or that traditional media is being destroyed is a byproduct of something better emerging. It's like saying, let's go back to the horse and cart because all of the horse rearers and trainers are going to be disrupted. Um, disruption is a byproduct and overall so long as there's no command and control structure and the government stepping in to solve non-existent problems which create all of these issues that need to be dealt with later with band-aid solutions, I don't think we're going to have a problem. So I'd really challenge and I'd love to see the basis of this theory that disruption is causing something that actually needs to be solved. But there might, I mean, I think even if you go and look at, I mean, if you talk about, okay, self-driving cars, Self-driving cars come on the, on the road. Don't tell me Uber will keep its fleet of drivers. No. It's, drivers will be gone and Uber will be, you know, doing self-driving cars. And, OK, well, that's great. But when, what happens to the Uber drivers? I mean, there's something like... I was reading the other day. There's something like two or three million truck drivers in the US alone. Mm. What are they all going to do when trucks drive themselves? I mean, I just... I do think that you do... Yes, I don't... I'm not saying that you should stop it and say, well, we should just not invent the self-driving car, because that's a stupid answer, you know, it's going to happen. But, you know, there does need to be thought about how do we equip, and it, you know, that many people who have no job. The market-based economy has solved this problem over hundreds of years, where industry has ceased to... It's fast before. <coughs> It solved it faster. People were saying the same thing about tram drivers before they introduced tram coin machines. 
It doesn't require smart people at Monash University solving a problem. It requires the free exchange of millions of people in win-win exchanges over time that causes these things to exist. Like, we've had command and control economies historically and they don't work. Like, there's enough history in the room and enough knowledge in the room to say that that doesn't work. So... Historically... Hang on, just, just before you speak, because we've got some roving mic... We've got a roving mic. Yep, it'll have to rope fast. <laughs> historically, though, that win has been shared around with a reasonable distribution. The smarter the larger businesses get, they're doing more and more with less and less people and more and more technology, and it's concentrating wealth yeah. for less and less people. So, yes, society has evolved and solved this over time, but the, where the money is going is, is reducing and concentrating. So there will be a lot more um, people missing out on that it's not to say I don't think you should stop it, but how do you address that? Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely, and I was shaking my head during um, David's monologue. Sorry, <laughs> Matt. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty staunch on this subject. I think if you look at what's happened in America, the reason that there is a madman running the free world is because of exactly what you've just described. There are people in America that, I mean, you've just got to look at places like Virginia... Um, any town that's been decimated by, you know, technology or closure of, of its industry or whatever, that, that's not a world that I want to live in. I don't know about you. We've had it pretty good here for a long time and I think it's going to go to hell pretty quickly is my summation of the whole thing. Um, I think there's going to be an underclass probably for, you know, like a real underclass like there is in America. Um, I think that uh, it's going to get really, really difficult. You've already got a whole generation of people who can't afford to buy into the housing market. Um, you know, things are changing really, really dramatically, and I don't think, you know, for the better. You look at productivity in Australia, wages haven't grown for how long? A very long time. Prices are going... You know, it's, it's, it, all the signs are there. Um, I think it's, it's going to be quite diabolical. So how do you, what do you do? I think that... The, uh, either probably, you know, in a true capitalist sort of um, way, you would hope that large organisations would um, actually help. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, I, I sat down with my nephew, who's 20-something, I don't know, he's young, um, <laughs> at State of Origin in Queensland, and um, he works for Telstra up in Brisbane, and he was saying to me, you know, what should I do with my life? And I said, go and do psychology because I reckon human services yep, is the one thing. We're all, we're, I mean, hopefully um, it won't happen. You know, I'm hoping I just get through, but I, I think it's going to be diabolical, actually. I, I think trying to, trying to sort of turn the lemons into lemonade thing, you know, I think that, um, well, a couple of things. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the, the US, um, you know, where I spent the, the majority of the last few years, um, you know, there is a shortage of computer scientists. There is a shortage of technologists to work on technology problems. I mean, if you if you want to get ahead and make a lot of money, become a computer scientist. I mean, it's the best paid profession in the world right now. Um, you know, all of the large tech companies are hiring as fast as they can um, from outside of the US to get people into the US. I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge requirement to, to have more people, you know, building technology, and that's why the, that's why the wages are so high. Um, so I think... I think there's that opportunity there. Now, I, you know, I, I'm not the, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. I'm not the right person to talk about, you know, how we, how we drive the social change. But I would love to see us invest in science, technology, engineering, and math far more deeply in schools. Mm. Um, I would, I would, I would love the next generation of people to, to have those skills and to, to go and go and take those jobs. And, you know, and I think they will be incredibly interesting jobs. I mean, I think that, you know, computer science is a wonderful blend of art and science and, you know, it's a very creative field and it's a great place to be. And I, I, I genuinely hope that, you know, the next generation takes advantage of that and that there's even more innovation, even more disruption and, a, you know, and, a, and, and much more interesting places to work. I hope that, I hope that you know, we don't, we don't uh, have the next generation doing repetitive tasks that can be that can be automated. I hope they're able to use you know all the qualities that they bring as people in the best way possible to do really interesting things. I think that's I think that's our hope. So there's one thing that you can do to to help. I think is to help push for science, technology, engineering, and maths in school. And uh, I worry about Australia. I've only been back mm. here six months, but I, I I worry very deeply about that. Um, you know, my 
I've enrolled my daughters in a, in a, a private school that I won't name. It's you know, expensive and, and fantastic. It's got a beautiful, broad curriculum, but it's got this huge gaping hole in the middle uh, where there is no computer science. Yeah. Um, so, you know, are we building the next generation leaders or, or not? You know, I think They're teaching really the wrong question. language, quite literally. Yeah, I mean... They're probably teaching French or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, you know? poor yeah, Spanish-speaking yeah. daughters doing French and having a horrible time. But, yeah. but I, wanted to be, I, wanted to be doing, I wanted to be doing Python. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, I'm a graduate of the law faculty at Monash, and um, the first thing I want to say is that... Um, the business faculty serves a better grade of wine than what the law faculty does. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be taking that up with the dean. Um, someone made the comment that um, companies use data in the right way for its customers. Now, if I've got a business and I'm depending upon buying data, and all of a sudden there's a disruption in that data, and my business fails, if I try to sue you for loss of commercial opportunity in the court system, I'm going to get absolutely crushed because um, you're going to make out that uh, I'm not going to have a case and I'm going to be, find it damn hard to prove that I have got a case. So how do, how do the panellists feel? There's going to have to be a, a radical rethink in the legal system for re giving customers redress when the data that they're buying just doesn't come. <laughs> I, think, I think, honestly, that's beyond me. Um, I think somebody else should, should take that one. I don't know. My, only... <laughs> my, my wife's a lawyer, but I'm, I'm not, so I'm opting out. <laughs> no, my only experience with the legal system is that um, the only people it works out for is the lawyers, so I can't... <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> you know, stuff is not fair, and that's just the way it is. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Lucas, I wanted to... Uber is quite interesting in that with the disruption it's causing, it's actually creating more jobs. Um, and the taxi drivers who have been mercilessly exploited for decades are suddenly finding that they might be better off switching to Uber because they'll get better remuneration and better terms and conditions. They can actually work when they want, etc. Mm -hmm. um, Uber Eats is creating jobs for um, not only those that are creating the food in the restaurants, but for those that are delivering as well. So is that leaving aside Kate's issue about when we get self-drive cars, or it won't be in my lifetime, but in, in terms of right across the road. But, but let, let's leave that aside for the moment. You're actually creating a lot of jobs because you're meeting consumer needs. Isn't that also... And, and Rebecca, you're going to create a lot of jobs in, you know, in terms of the NRL because you'll be meeting the consumer needs. Um, you're creating jobs in terms of, um, it may not necessarily be in Australia, but in terms of your warehousing, well, your warehousing logistics and delivery. Um, uh, so, and, and you're doing the same thing in terms of the, Kate, in terms of what you're producing and, again, the logistics and delivery. So what I'm wondering is whether we've not got a shift from the bricks and mortar retailer, the process line manufacturer, um, the taxi driver, whatever might be, into something that's a lot more, that's different, but is actually creating jobs and therefore creating you know, standards of living, high standards of living for people that are involved in just that. And I'm wondering whether the disruption we're talking about is rather more a redirection of approach, a redirection of, of education and a redirection, this is what Hugh, Hugh's line, mm -hmm. but a redirection of education, but also a redirection of skills into a different format than what has been there before, rather than necessarily putting a whole lot of people out of work. That's right. I think education's right, but the challenge we've got here is that we're not doing a great job of the subjects that we need to be, as, as a, you know, as a, as a kind of nation, we're really, really languishing in STEM subjects, and that is going to be a really big problem for us, in what you're describing. If we don't kind of get with that, and look, um, the, yeah, it's going to be a big problem. And the problem is, is that you can't educate people as fast as these changes are happening. Um, not to, yeah. Well, if you haven't started, certainly. If you not. haven't started, haven't no, even exactly. Really started, you know, that's, no. that's the challenge, I think. No. But see, Lucas doesn't have to educate the thousands of drivers that are now part of Uber, or the thousands of delivery operators that are part of Uber, other than in basic. Yeah, standard of, of care and of, of approach to customers. Um, uh, you don't have to educate people 
extensively as to how you run your warehouse or delivery or dispatch or whatever it might be. Same thing with you, Kate. So I'm just, uh, while education is important at certain echelons of what we're dealing with, I'm wondering whether, in fact, we're not creating different jobs to meet a different purpose. Um, and that requires people to work faster and more productively, but to actually meet consumer needs rather than be doing it the way they're doing it in the past, mm -hmm. without a major educational um, uh, yeah, change. Really For a short period. Yeah. It depends on the period of time, I guess. Mm. Yeah. You know, my, my, my thinking is that that period of time is going to be quite short. Mm. Yeah. So I think driverless cars and, you know, they're already using driverless machines in mines and, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. in quite, you know, dangerous kind of circumstances. Mm. I don't think the timeline is going to be that long. And so those drivers that, yes, you don't have to educate will be notionally out of work at some point. I also think that there'll be work created by the more efficient mm. utilisation of resources, right? So, so for example, if you think about if you think about food delivery, you know, Uber Eats. I did some work with DoorDash in the states. Um, you know, they have two big peaks, right? So they have the lunchtime peak, and then things go flat, and then they have an <coughs> evening peak, and things go flat, and they've got all these they've got people who sit around, and they've got equipment that's sitting around that's that's idle, right? So there's an opportunity there for somebody to come and fill that valley in and flatten that off, and everybody wins. So, you know. If you're, if you're at work and you want food delivered in the afternoon for, you know, a, an event or, you know, you want to get it in early for dinner, whatever it is, you know, they've got the capacity, they've got the people, they've got the equipment. So I think that's the other thing too, is you're going to see mm. more efficient utilisation of resources. And, and partnerships. That, that will, yeah. you know, that, that will, will have the, the effect of creating more jobs and, um, you know, and uh, more efficient use of people, you know, I think, which I think is great. It's all on. Yeah. Um, what's interesting that everybody talks about STEM. Um, for Hugh, my son's in grade one. He does science. He's in a public school. Good on um, you. <laughs> they've been doing that since prep. Awesome. Um, but really it's about the skills that are transferable that we need in the future. It's about collaboration, relationship building, creativity, thinking outside the box, connectivity. Mm. And, you know, it's one thing to learn to be an engineer. It's the one thing... And it's another thing um, for me, who I work with a whole lot of engineers and I'm not an engineer, to be able to have those skills to understand other people when those, and to be able to change and move on and say, mm -hmm. oh, yep. one day I do this and then five years later I'm doing something completely different. Mm. Yep. I think that sort of agile thinking and being able to respond to ambiguous and complex situations is really the biggest thing that, you know, that we need to be teaching people, I actually think that's the most important thing for universities to be teaching because, you know, anything, like any fact that you need to know, right, you can just look it up on Google. Mm. You know, nobody needs to teach you any facts. Um, but, yes, those skills of taking a very complex and ambiguous situation and working out even what the problem is before, you know, coming up with ideas as to how to solve it. I actually did, and this is, you know, showing my age again, but, um, you know, in the early 90s in high school, we did a fantastic program called Future Problem Solving, and it was, it was, it was actually this exact thing. Um, and I wish that that was something that, you know, I don't know whether this is a program that's still even running now in high schools, but, gee, it was good, because that, that was what it, it tried to teach you, was agile thinking and, and trying to solve a problem, and that's something that, you know, you can't... You know. transferable. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's something as well that Australia in general has been good at, right? So maybe STEM we have under-focused on, but, it, but generally we have a, that entrepreneurial spirit, mm. that ability yep. to think outside the square. And I think you even look at, look at the value, right? And a lot, of, a lot of top tech entrepreneurs aren't investing their children in STEM. They're sort of like keeping their, they're making them swing on trees and keeping them off their, off their phones for their first few there, years yep, yep. because they recognise that importance of creative thinking. Um, so at least, I guess, we've got that part right. Maybe just now we need to, mm. to round it out yeah. instead. Yeah. And maybe sort of reinforcing the point, I mean, I think that, um, you know, taking on Kate's point, really, you know, if you go and look at how the tech companies hire, they don't hire for skills, they hire for competencies, right, because it's changing so fast. So, you know, um, I learned a lot about hiring when I was at Microsoft, and, you know, I, I came to believe that if you're, hire, you want, if you're hiring great software engineers, you want four things. You want intellectual horsepower, problem-solving skills, you want them to be action-oriented, you know, they want to start and do things, and you want them to drive for a result. That's what you want. Anybody who's got those, those four things and is qualified in computer science can learn, adapt, change, innovate, and grow with, with, you know, with, with things as they change. And so I think that's incredibly important. You, know, you want people mm. who have that agile way, yep. of, way of thinking um, because skills just come and go. You know, the languages I learnt in, um, when I was studying computer science and no longer used in computer science. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know. I learnt Perl script. Oh, Perl's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I did that future proofing course too. I think it was 1994. And um, when I was doing the future proofing course, they said the internet was going to democratise the world. And I agree with the fellow over there that we saw this disaggregation of wealth. And that's because of the trust protocol of needing to use intermediaries such as banks and whatnot to be able to trade. We've now seen blockchain come in as a major ability for the true democratisation of the internet and the potential to disrupt the disruptors. So I'd like to get the feedback of the panel about how blockchain will potentially disrupt the disruptors and how you're planning to um, consider that as part of your organisations. Well, one-day drivers might want to be paid in cryptocurrency, so we'd, we'd very much welcome that if, they, uh, if that was their intent. Um, I, guess, I guess where the, the difference for us being um, you know, largely our, our model is based on not less, less on the, less on the, uh, the bits and more on the atoms um, in, in terms of moving real people around. But I think um, you know, Uber, is, Uber is as right for disruption as, as anyone else. Um, I think if we, if we take our eye off the customer, um, which can very easily happen as we become a, a, a behemoth, um, then you know, there's, there's no stopping someone else coming in. The, the barriers are pretty low, right? Um, our drivers aren't employees. They have, they have choice. Um, if they feel they can get a, a better gig somewhere else, um, they'll, they'll, they'll do that. And they, it's as simple as, and, and many do, right? They have two or three apps open. Uh, particularly, I've seen, I saw a picture in Asia with a, a motorbike guy with like five apps open. <laughs> and so well, it's up to us really to, to make sure we are delivering the right outcomes for, for these customers. Um, but, but even... That, that's sort of an immediate term piece. Um, for us, obviously, our, the next chapter in point-to-point -point transport will be, and we've already spoken about it on the panel <laughs> today, is, is around autonomous vehicles. Um, and it's something, obviously, um, you know, Google, Google's weighed into and, and Tesla's weighed into and, and, and we've leaned into as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's something we need, to, we need to focus on the now, but we need to focus on the future. I suppose what I'm more interested in is not so much the currency exchange is that as a contract and a blockchain account holder, I own my own data and I get to choose who gets to have it. And I have a relationship with whoever I want to have a relationship with. So therefore, if I own my own data and I get to choose that, how does that fit within your current business models? Look, I'll be the first to say it's above my pay grade. I'm still just trying to get my head around how blockchain actually works. So. <laughs> I think one of the things with blockchain right now too is it means a whole bunch of things. I mean, I think you know, it's a bit like saying artificial intelligence is going yeah. to blah, 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 blah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a very broad field mm. with, a, with a lot of meaning that's very unstable. You know, like lots of things are changing and evolving. Um, so I think, I think from my perspective, it's a little bit of a wait and see. I mean, people have been talking about Bitcoin and blockchain for right. four or five years mm. now and investing in it. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen... I'm just one person with opinion, but I haven't seen anything truly disruptive happen in that space yet. No. So I think from my perspective, it's a, it's a wait and see. Yeah. Um, I think it does have the potential to do some, some really interesting, impactful things and, and, and change the dynamics, but um, hasn't happened yet. I've not yet seen the thing where, you know, you look at that and you go, wow, that would really revolutionise things for my customers and therefore for my business. That would really transform. So I, I haven't seen that thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, because you, you use the words before that you use blockchain as a result, you own your own data. Um, we all own our own data. Mm. Uh, I make a decision whether or not I'll subscribe to Uber, uh, whether I'll have a flybys card at Coles or an Everyday Rewards at, at Woolworths. I make that decision, but it's my data that's been then fed into the system and is being used or transformed, whatever the case might be. But, you, you know, it's my data. Uh, it, it's the moment I put it into a a business operation and is transformed through the investment that's undertaken by that business operation, that I probably start to relinquish control over that data because I've given it to them. I did so knowingly. I gave it to Uber when I subscribed to Uber um, the day after I retired from the Taxi Services Commission. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you, you know, that, that happens all the time. We do it every day from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to bed at night and even through the middle of the night. There's data that's being, that, that is ours that's being used, um, even if it's only through your, your phone uh, or your Fitbit that's uh, telling you how you're sleeping at night. It's all data that you've got. <coughs> you can choose to take, <coughs> sorry, take your Fitbit off and people won't know how you're sleeping necessarily. But, but that's your choice, isn't it? And, and I thought the interesting comment was made by Lucas when he said um, the result of what they're doing 
is that they've got to focus not only on what the consumer wants, because if they don't satisfy the consumer, they can charge their 3.5 times you know, surcharge, um, but, but you know, the people will do what I do and say, so stuff that, I'll go and use a taxi, whatever it was, and it costs a lot less. But um, it, yeah, that's consumer choice. So they've got to do what the consumer wants in terms of quality, um, the standard of behaviour of drivers, um, you know, abiding by the speed limit by drivers and the like. But also, interestingly, they've got to focus on what suits the driver. So if they start to lift their commission charges, then they'll get complaints from drivers and drivers will start to go away and do something else, right? Now, um, Rebecca has said that in the NRL, they're going to have to focus on owning their supporters. What do you got, seven million? Yeah. All right? And, you know, the more you can, quotes, own, um, the better in terms of your own business product into the future. Um, you've got to own your buyers. Um, and that, so that they won't just buy one product and then never come back, but that they'll constantly come back and see you as the place of preference. And you've got to own your buyers. The fascinating thing is if you look at all the group here, I'm leaving Google out for because we get into so many noughts it doesn't matter. But if you look at all the others, um, you've got literally tens of millions of subscribers that are there, you know, that are part of your databases. Uh, and one of the things that I was going to put to you is this. You've got, what do you got, half a million, a million subscribers or more? A million riders, more than a million riders here in Melbourne. Yeah, room. right. So more than a million riders in Melbourne, right? And take it around the nation, whatever it is, right? You'd love to have access to them, Absolutely. right? So why don't you do a deal? <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but why is there not that cross-fertilisation? You, Rebecca, would love to have access to um, not you know, the, the, the information that Uber might have relating to um, those that support rugby league. We're talking to Uber. <laughs> okay, right, there you go. So, so it's, We're obviously it's, doing a lot of deals here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but that's the cross-fertilisation. It comes from the fact that we, all of us, make a decision that our data is useful if it's applied in a business and the business can use it for our advantage. Now, the interesting question would be is when they apply for our disadvantage, which is another issue which we'll battle later on. But, but do, do you want to just address how that, that might be fermented, it might be taken forward? Uh, well, we're a big consumer of data as a retail business, so 20% um, of our traffic is supplied by this man in the middle from Google. Not him personally, but his organisation. <laughs> um, so, uh, and we use that data to feed our customers relevant products. We also use the data supplied by the customers directly to us to feed them relevant products and upsells and those sorts of things and recommendations. So it's a huge part of our business. And, you know, there are a lot of competitive disadvantages to pure online retail, but there are a few competitive advantages. And one of the competitive advantages is that we can create a different storefront and a different proposition to each consumer individually. So when you walk into a Meyer or a David Jones, there's the same store layout for every single person who walks into that store. Even though I'm not interested in the cosmetics department, it's still the first thing that I'm shown when I walk into the store. Whereas, you know, if you receive a Kogan email or come to our store we, and you're a member, you sign up, you know, we have your data, we can create an entirely personalised, customised experience for you and that gives us a huge competitive advantage over bricks and mortar retail. So uh, data is very important for online retail, hugely important. Um, if you were to conceal your data, it would be to our detriment. Um, but some people do it, you know, there are people who um, have ad blockers on the internet, so th that's, a, that's a competitive threat for Google. Um, but, um, you know, while people are willing to optimise their traffic experience online by giving up their data, we'll certainly make use of that. Oh, yeah, look, I mean, it's, yeah, we use data in, in very similar ways and it's, you know, in the end, it's all about making sure that you're delivering enough value for the customer for them to <coughs> want to give up their data to you. I mean, if you're going to say, hey, look, you know what, if you tell me a little bit about your skin type, I can make sure you don't buy the wrong thing. Mm. I can make sure that you'll be happy with what you get. Wouldn't that be good? Because Maya is not going to do that for you. 
you could walk into Maya and pick up every single moisturiser and there's not one person in there that could tell you about every single one of them. Um, and half the time, you know, I think pretty much every, you know, woman in this room and half the guys would have a graveyard of things that they've never used or have used a couple of times and didn't like sitting under their bathroom sink and can't throw them out because they were too expensive. And, you know, if we can solve that problem using data, then for a customer that's a tremendous value. Hey, you don't have to waste your money anymore on crap you don't like. You know, this is a good thing. Rebecca, how do you own your customer? How do you own your supporters beyond putting on a game and hoping that they'll attend and or else watch on TV? Yeah, so we haven't, is the short answer. But um, in December we're launching a new network um, of digital products, and, and I'm, a, I'm a, a big fan of data and um, forced logging. Um, and I'm also a big fan of, the, you know, what you were describing in the exchange, the classic, you know, it's just marketing, right, the give-get. <coughs> so we've got to work really hard at um, ensuring that people who come to the new products in December um, are incentivised and motivated enough to give us some of their information, and we start to... Um, then understand their behaviours and we can then personalise the experience for them and create a better experience. So, um, you know, I think that there's a, a big marketing job to do um, to ensure that people will sign up. Um, you know, we already have, as I said, a number of, you know, 7 million data sources that, that we're getting into a single customer view um, for next year, but then our job is to create a whole lot more um, so that we can start to drive business outcomes. And of course, Lucas, you can cross-sell. So you've got your Uber, your million Uber subscribers, which can then be cross-sold into Uber Eats, and who knows what's next? Yeah, I mean, we obviously have a lot of data um, in terms of where, where, where people ride and, and what they eat, as you know. Um, but we do take that role, uh, as I'm sure everyone on the panel does, um, that custodian role very, very seriously. And so... Um, I'm sure there are many riders in the room. I, I'd hazard to guess you probably can't remember the last time you even received an email from Uber. Um, we, we, we tend to be fairly strict on the way that we use data and engage, and, we, and when we do do it, we want to add a lot of value. Um, and so that's why you won't see sort of weekly emails from us um, spamming, spamming offers from partners or our, or our own propositions. Um, increasingly, though, we recognise the value of providing contextual value. Um, and so uh, as an example, like a... Probably one, of the, probably one of the opportunities we miss today um, is on the trip. So you book your Uber, um, the car comes, you check the registration plate, the driver, every, safe ride, and, and then you jump in the car and you put your phone away or you jump out of the Uber app and you sit there on a different platform. And so you know, we have, because we have the data around um, that, that, that user's habits, um, who we think that user might be, um, it's about how do we use that to, to begin engaging a little bit more um, can we provide some contextual offers for people when they're driving past their favourite Indian restaurant to maybe drop in and, and pay them a visit? Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a bunch more we can do, but we want to be really careful about how we use that so we don't um, overuse it, I guess, is, is the biggest risk. Mm. Uh, it it does, does point out, I'm going to come to you, it does point out, though, doesn't it, that when we give the data over to Uber, we think we're doing it just so that the driver knows where to come and pick us up and where to take us. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that data can be used for so many different purposes and we need just to be aware of it and be aware that's what's happening. And if you don't want it, then go back to the horse and buggy. Mm. <laughs> but, I, but I think that, you know, I, I think that Uber uses the data in lots of other ways that, that you're all aware of and that help, right? So at some level, you open up the Uber app and it says the car's three minutes away. How does it know it's three minutes away? Well, because... It's in a certain location with a certain amount of traffic. That's been done thousands of times before, and it knows that it's three minutes away, and it knows about the behaviour of the driver, right? When, it, when you jump in, it says it's going to take 16 minutes to get somewhere. I mean, that's, that's derived from the data of all those people who have done those things before, and I think you've come to expect that, right? You've ex you get grumpy when those numbers are wrong or the number goes up or whatever it is. I mean, you, you expect Uber to be doing a great job with this data and providing you with a great service. Well, that's so how Google Maps gets the traffic, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's from all the yeah. other people yeah. using right. Google right. Maps. Right. Yep. I think a lot of people, you know, think about the, the differentiators of Google Maps, but, you know, in, in, in my mind at least, you know, the, the single biggest differentiator is that we have the real-time traffic of most people moving in the world. Because you know all those people that, that are sitting you, there right? on Punt Road. Yep. Yeah, so and, people... And, and, and accuracy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. 
And yeah, I mean, you know, we have millions and millions of data points of where everybody is in the world, and we can use that to help you navigate the world. And, you know, I think a lot of people think of Google Maps today, unfortunately, as a as sort of an occasional tool when they're lost. You know, my advice to you would be use it every morning to go to and from work, because we know where the traffic is like. And if we send you down some street, you know, don't beat us up. You know, well, why did you send me down some crazy street? We sent you down a crazy street because you didn't want to go the normal way. Because the normal way is blocked. Yeah. You know, and reminds that's the, that's reminds me of Fast and Furious Seven, I think it was, or Six. One of them <laughs> with God's eye, God's eye. Marin, um, what was it described as? Something. I think she said it was Devil's Asshole or something like that. But she was corrected by a son to say, "No, it's God's eye," and it actually can tell where anyone in this room is at any point of time uh, of the day or night, as the case may be. And if you think about it, it's it's imaginary, of course, Hollywood. But it actually it's not that imaginary because when you put in your diary that you were going to come to 271 Collins Street um, uh, to um, a particular function here at tonight, that's there and it's entered into the database and with this so-called God's Eye software, um, it, can be, it, it can tell that it is almost certain you'll be sitting in this room tonight um, at this time from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, and then it goes from there. But anyway. Uh, just what I'm watching with interest, given it's a key part of our social fabric, is sport. I, I feel as though we're starting to be told what to watch, when to watch, how to watch it, and unless we can subscribe, we miss out. Look what Optus did with the EPL last year, for example. Yeah. <clears throat> Alienated a lot of people. They lost the chance to watch what was a key part of their sporting fabric. I'm feeling you hear about Twitter and Google buying up sporting rights. Do we end up alienating a whole raft of ordinary people who can't now watch what is really an integral part of our Australian lifestyle, sport. Rebecca? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, Australia's free-to-air television regime has certainly set the behaviour that, you know, it's almost the notion of TV being free and a large, you know, portion of that being access to sport being free is almost utility in this country, unlike any other, you know, certainly unlike the US, where the cable penetration is much higher and they've been taught to pay. Um, yeah, look, I think that there's a very real um, belief in this country that it is sort of a, a, a sort of human right to, to be able to turn on the box or, you know, whatever it is um, and, get, and get TV for free. I think the, the challenge with that is that... Um, that model uh, and the ability to, I guess, participate in that model kind of relied on, on um, scarcity. And we don't have that anymore. Um, you know, once I think we had, what, three or four TV channels and, you know, there, w there wasn't a lot of choice. Um, the challenge you've got now, of course, is that, you know, for, for a whole generation of people, the mobile phone and, and YouTube is television. Um, and so that, that makes it quite challenging from a business perspective um, combined with the fact that um, audiences are fragmenting, um, which kind of drives your um, potential price down anyway, uh, because, of course, what television relies on is that ability to aggregate audience in an hour um, with restricted choice. That's completely gone away. Um, so, unfortunately, you know, part of the, the change and the disruption to the, to the consumer or the fan, I guess, is the reality of business. Um, and that becomes a real challenge for, our, for us from a marketing point of view as well because we've got, if you consider um, at our place, we've got, you know, three really significant partners. We've got Nine, we've got Fox Sports and we've got Telstra. Now, we've also got, you know, one fan that we need to talk to in a meaningful way mm -hmm. and all three of them and us are now going to be talking to one fan. And they don't know that Telstra has this right and Nine has that right and they don't care, nor should they. But that's a real challenge for us, actually, in, in, you know, as we move into rolling out the network in December, is there are going to be certain things available with us, there'll be certain things available anywhere else. But, but the point, I suppose, for, from a business perspective is, um, because there is so much fragmentation now, you have to be able to meet, you know, that audience expectation. And that means you slice and dice your rights such that um, you don't necessarily get all games all the time on free-to-air television anymore. Um, and I think that's just, you know, a sort of change that has taken place um, in the media landscape. 
Can I ask, just a quick one on that, today viewership, I guess, of sport is fairly static, 2D, but there's obviously a lot happening around mm. virtual in stadium. Mm -mm. How does that change the landscape for you? Um, well, I mean, it makes it an incredible, um, it makes an incredible experience. So we did some stuff with virtual reality um, last year, and I think it, it our, our ability to or inability to reach an audience is largely today predicated on our rights regime. So we go and sell our rights to various parties, as I've just described, um, and they then have, you know, they then effectively have control. Um, I think that, you know, the challenge is knowing at what point you, you know, we've started to sort of slowly with the, with the pulling the network back in house. So historically the NRL had um, Telstra go and build the network for them and, and deliver the, the, you know, the websites and the apps and all of that. We've decided that we need to build capability and ability and, and bring that in house. Um, you know, it's trying to keep an eye on, uh, I guess, what is progressing from a technology point of view, what is possible, but also how do you run a business that is reliant on funding? Um, and today, the funders of that business buy the rights and then do, the, do certain things with the rights that may or may not mean that that opportunity that is happens. met. Yeah. And so that's the real kind of tension point, I suppose. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, I guess like any business, there's trade-offs. All right, I've got one just here, uh, <clears throat> and then one over there, and then we'll have to call it to a, um, a halt because we're going to run out of time, but there'll be a chance to network with the guys after. So, yeah. Great. Um, I come from a cyber security background, so I've got a particular perspective on all this um, uh, centralisation of all the data that's being developed. But my question is really more directed at the, the chat from Google. Uh, my, you know, clearly, you're an intelligent guy. Why did you decide uh, to go over to the US and work for, for Google versus uh, you know, incubating a you know, great Australian startup right here in Melbourne? That's a good question. Um, look, I, I went to the US in, um, I think it was 2004, so a you know, long time ago. Um, you know, I probably wasn't in a position to start a company, and you know, it was a you know, significant time back in my career, so really I made that decision some time back. I think the question probably now is, will I do that, I think, you know, um, post post Google, so look forward to figuring that out. I'd love to do something uh, something here in Melbourne. I think that'd be fantastic. I mean, there's an amazing talent here. Um, and I'm I'm uh, I'm excited by the startup scene in particular here. So it must work. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot going on now in Melbourne. I think it's I think it's um, plenty of opportunity to do something, so hopefully I'll get that chance. I just wanted to ask the panel about um, digital disruption for social good. Um, I'll give you two quick examples, something like uh, Kiva, which enables me to do microcredit loans to people in the third world that I've never met, yep. but also equally for social, social good and commercial gain. Uh, things like Tesla, you know, if, you, if you work on the basis that fossil fuels are you know, bad for the planet, etc., etc., that Elon Musk has been able to demonstrate that you can create an electric car um, that's good, you can build the infrastructure to, um, to recharge them so it gets rid of range, anxiety, all those sorts of things. Uh, can you comment a little bit on, on that for me? Um, I'll tell you something that um, I was really excited about working on maps um, last year was uh, a software engineer went to a small African country and discovered that people didn't have addresses because the, the, or the, you know, the infrastructure wasn't there to give people addresses. <laughs> Right, so lived in a lived in a lived in a, a village, and you know there just isn't a council that has all the, the, the know-how to actually decide what streets are called, put up street signs, allocate people numbers, you know, those kinds of things. And so what happened in that country was that um, if people wanted to get something delivered, it'd be just sort of delivered to the post office, and then you sort of had to kind of figure out that you had something at the post office and track and kind of get it. And everybody was very frustrated by that. You know, people wanted things delivered to them, but they didn't know where they lived. Um, so what he decided was he was going to create human readable codes that could be used to identify any roughly 10 metre square thing in the whole world. Was that the and, three words? Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. So he invented this, this idea of you know, coming up with a string that you could remember and that describes your patch and just went and did it. So he just kind of, you know, sort of, he, was a, he was a Google Maps guy, he just went, right, I'm going to do this and in his spare time just sort of built this into the Google Maps code base and now if you go and look at the, the local cards in Google Maps, they have that, they have that string in them. Um, so I thought that was I thought that was really cool. I mean, I think you know, in the in the press, people wondering what we're up to, and you know, blah 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 blah. The reality is, you know, there's there's lots of good people out there who want to spend you know some of their time doing doing good things, and uh, um, and you know, Google's the kind of place that lets you go and do that, and you know, good good kind of things happen. So um, I'm really excited about that. Um, I think, uh, and I think 
I'd like to see more of it. I mean, I think I think you know the the, the large companies that are profitable and and are doing well and do have the resources ought to give back and give back more and more as you know as, as I guess as wealth gets concentrated. You know, I think it becomes becomes incumbent upon them. And other people mentioned education as well. I think that's really important. You know, I think that you know these companies have the opportunity to to do that and do that globally. I think that's really exciting. Um, so I hopefully you know my small example is the first in uh, many good things that happen. All right, uh, we're going to have to draw proceedings uh, to a close. I'm going to ask Edward uh, Buckingham from Monash Business School to come and say uh, thank you. Can I just conclude by saying this? Um, as we were having some drinks before, I was challenged um, uh, with the comment that the first leadership panel that we had uh, <coughs> involving um, uh, economics, uh, particularly in the global scene, uh, set a high benchmark. And I said I thought this one would set a higher benchmark. And um, I'd like to say my own view is that, that you've done just that. So to my uh, panellists um, that have come from well, such this a... This has got some women on, so <laughs> <this is better>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but um, so, so let me say thank you to you all, but uh, I'm going to hand it over to Edward. Thank you very much, Graham. On behalf of the audience and also Monash Business School, David, Kate, Hugh, Rebecca and Lucas, thank you very much for spending this evening with us. It's been a tremendous opportunity, I think. I just wanted to focus on two quick ideas before we stop and have something to drink and something to eat. The first is, if you think back to the Industrial Revolution in England, late 17th century, early, 20th, early 18th century, the invention of the hand loom that replaced manual stitching had two impacts, two big impacts on the UK economy. For the first time, British people started to dress well. <laughs> but one of the direct other consequences with the Industrial Revolution was that British food went downhill badly. And this is actually what we're looking at now. It's a series of choices that come with this disruption. The disruption is coming. The question really is for each one of us, is how are we going to make use of this fantastic machine that we carry around with us? In what ways are we going to respond to the machinery that's going to be made available to us? And in what ways are we going to leverage that to increase productivity and to make this country better than it already is? Now, I have to say also that Australian food took off after 1980. Before 1980, sorry guys, it wasn't great. But from this, that point up until now, it's gotten better and better. And that has been because we have fantastic institutions in this country. We are democratic. We know how to debate issues. We know how to deal with regulation. We have competition commissions and the like. And we also have entrepreneurs who have a social conscience. And this is really the fabric that ties us together. And having an opportunity like this evening, which I'm very grateful is supported by our business school and by our university, gives us an opportunity to make this, this discussion alive. Finally, Graham, thank you very much for bringing this all together and also to the Business Advisory Board. We couldn't have done it without you, but I'd also like to make a special thanks to Liz Lowe. Where is she? Outside. This is terrible. Liz Lowe is the person behind the machine. She is the person who's brought you all together this evening. She has sent out the invitations. She has scripted the evening. She's arranged, arranged the live streaming. And to her, I'm extremely gra grateful. I'm sorry she isn't here, but if you see her later this evening, please thank her on our behalf. Thank you. <laughs>